I, I want to begin by actually just reading from the modern English version, chapter one, uh, par chapter two, paragraph one, up to the point where we ended, <clears throat> which was on the sovereignty of God. So we read, the Lord our God is one, the only living and true God. He is self-existent and infinite in being and perfection. His essence cannot be understood by anyone but Him. He is a perfectly pure spirit. He is invisible and has no body, parts, and passions. He alone has immortality, dwelling in light that no one can approach. He is unchangeable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, in every way infinite, absolutely holy, perfectly wise, wholly free, completely absolute, and this is where we were at last time. He works all things according to the counsel of his own unchangeable and completely righteous will for his own glory. So we'll pause there and we'll recap that, that one sentence, at least in the modern English, it's one sentence, which is about the sovereignty of God. Our God decrees the end from the beginning and our God not only plans it, he providentially orders everything so that it would reach his intended purposes and his plans would be fulfilled. His plans do not fail, okay? And of course, we'll learn this later on in the confession, God uses means. For example, the word is his primary means. Isaiah talks about the word of God as almost like rain. It comes from the sky, it goes into the ground, it waters the plants, it achieves its purposes, and in like manner, the word of God which he sends forth will not return to him void, will not return to him without accomplishing his purposes. So this is um, preempting our study a little bit, but I want to just quickly distinguish between God's decrees and then God's providence. <clears throat> so, God's decrees, not degrees, decrees are the plans that he has made before creation. He's already planned your steps. He's already planned that you would exist. He's already planned that you would die. He's already planned that Jesus would come. He's already planned that the world um, would culminate in the, the return of Jesus Christ. He's already planned everything. And it's not just the big stuff mentioned in the Bible. It's all of this stuff. It's that he'd planned that you'd be sitting here today. He, he planned that you'd be part of this discussion. He planned that whatever happened this morning to you happened, would happen. He planned everything, okay? He's decreed everything from eternity past. But then we must distinguish that from what we call his providence, okay? His providence is his meticulous, ongoing, ordering of everything in the universe which ensures that what he has already decreed shall certainly come to pass. Decrees before or outside time, providence, God's movement in ordering everything in time. He uses both natural means like literal rain and things that happen in the world. He's in control of all of that. And he uses supernatural means like the word sacraments, and prayer, all right, for spiritual purposes. And in all of this, keep in mind, God is exercising his, this is why I mention it, his sovereignty. His authority, his rule, his control, his dominion over everything in the universe. You know what, what Mr. R.C. Sproul said a, a while back, right? That there's not a single maverick molecule in this universe. Not a single molecule that is outside the sovereign control of God. Yes. It might sound like a dumb question, but did God decree that I should like ice cream? Yes. Oh, so you don't... <laughs> but does that mean you still like ice cream? As a person, or is uh, it let me ask God you: Do you still like I, ice cream? I, I, I like ice cream. But I I'm can saying. tell you, yes, 100%. God decreed that you would like ice cream, and I can also ask you: Do you really, truly, personally like ice cream? Do you? Yes. So there is no antithesis. There is no dichotomy. God decreed that you would truly like ice cream, and you truly like ice cream. And it's not something that you were coerced to like. 
Although in some cases you could be, I guess. But in God's ordering of all things, he ensured that that would actually come about. Whether that be who you are, your upbringing, your DNA, your taste buds, all of those things and so forth. God is meticulously ordering all things. So, yes, he decreed that you would like ice cream. He ensured that you would come to like ice cream. But, as we'll learn later on in the confession, God's sovereignty and his providence and meticulous ordering of all things does not do violence upon your actual willful volition to enjoy ice cream because you like it. So do you like ice cream? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. It is bad to like ice cream. Okay. And, he, and, and God decreed both of those statements as well. And there are some things that God decrees that I just don't understand. That, all right? So, and that's okay. Um, so, that's an exercise of God's sovereignty. His providence in the world, ordering all things so that what he wants to happen, happens. Remember, stuff happens in the world, not just because God looked down the tunnels of time and then saw, ah, oh, that's what's going to happen. But because, as he says in the scriptures, I have decreed the end from the beginning. So he's working all things according to the counsel of his immutable and most righteous will. Oh, we should pause there. Immutable. Can't stop it. Can't change it. Can't thwart it. Can't do anything about it. His will shall prevail. The counsel of the wicked, they make many plans. But at the end of the day, it is the will of the Lord that shall prevail. And his will is his most righteous will. His, his work in the universe, his plans in the universe flow out of his own righteous will. And he does all of it for his own glory. Okay? That brings us now. Yes? What's the easiest way to make sense of God's will? The easiest way? I am not so sure. But I can tell you a way, if you would like to, um, the easiest way, which I do not know, we'll talk about later. But um, one way that we wrestle with that reality is, is to, um, well, actually, the teachings of the rest of the confession, which we'll go into when we talk about decrees and free will and things like that, um, is when you go back to the garden, right? Let's just go back to the first instance where this seems to be a conundrum for many. Did God decree from eternity past that Adam would fall. Well, well, yes, that has to be the case because he is God. Nothing happens that's not under his watch. And whether you use terms of, you know, his permissive will, he allowed it to happen. Nevertheless, it's decreed, right? But, but did God have to actually create evil in Adam? Did he actually create sin in Adam? Did he actually coerce Adam forcefully and violently to sin? And we maintain, may it never be. That, that is not the case. There is a sense of mystery here. That God would decree even evil to come to pass, but he never carries it out by his own hand, for he never performs evil. Even when that decreed evil act is performed, it is out of the free and willful volition of the creature, who has been given a legitimate will to do and to want and to desire that which is consistent with its own nature. Okay? So not the easiest, but a way. <laughs> okay? So now let's go to the love of God. Um, still reading from the modern English. So after completely righteous will for his own glory, um, then you got footnote 12. Here's the next sentence. He is most loving, gracious, merciful, and patient. Or the old English, long-suffering. I love that. He overflows with goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. He rewards those who seek him diligently. So it is common, right, that we speak of the love of God, and specifically to see in the scriptures that God is love. Remember we talked about this, that, that there is not some arbitrary standard which we call thing, which we call love, and then God is a being that just so happens to conform to that standard, well, then what is that standard? Who, who made that standard? Where did that standard come from, right? But God himself is love. 
He is love. He is light. He is good. He is love. And that all true love flows from him. Goodness flows from him. Um, praise God from whom all blessings flow, right? Every good thing comes from the Father of lights and flows from him to us. So he is love, and therefore he is a loving God. That's what we read here, most loving. He is the most loving. There actually is no being who is more loving than love himself. He is love. So that's why any attempt at saying like, looking at what God does in the Bible, teachings of God in the Bible and so on, and then you know somebody likes to say, that's not very loving. I mean, we have just, we've messed up big time <laughs> when we start doing that. So w w what do you mean by love? L love in accordance to who? How do you actually know what real love is? God is most loving. Uh, and how do we know love? Well, you can find love in many places, or we could seek to try to find it. But remember, if God is love, no one has ever seen God, who is love. But the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, John 1, 18, He has revealed Him to us. So there are many general notions of love that we can learn, but in particular, we, we come to personally experience true love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the most spectacular act of love that has been ever shown, and therefore we can't actually, in our own human experience, describe a, a, a greater expression of love. That's why John speaks in that way, that, that God loved the world in this way. And that's why we know love. We have come to know God, who is love, in His Son, Jesus Christ. And that love of God has been poured out for us upon the cross of Calvary. God is love. He is a union or communion of love. Not to stretch these kinds of analogies too much, but God has always been love. He'll always be love. The Father and Son and Holy Spirit are eternally a union of love. So God is most loving. There is nobody that is more loving than God is. Uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we can speak of love in much more general terms, for sure. But for the Christian, the, the ultimate expression of love that God has for us is experience in Christ. In love, he predestined us. Ephesians chapter 1. Okay? So we are loved by God experientially, knowingly, fully, and understand, understood in Christ. You want to look at what the love of God looks like? Look to Christ. The love of God in Him, through Him, is manifested to us. And this God who is most loving, He is gracious. Most loving gracious, merciful, long-suffering or patient, and abundant or overflowing with goodness and truth. A lot of these words are taken directly from the scriptures, right? Um, God is gracious. What is our benediction every Sunday morning? The Lord bless you and keep you. It is a, a, a blessing of the gracious God, that he would shine upon you. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. Psalm 27. This is our God. He is gracious and he is merciful. He shows mercy to people who are penitent or unrepentant, or, or sorry, repentant. Remember in um, Luke chapter 18, there were two kinds of people. There was the tax collector who could hardly lift his eyes to heaven and speak to this great holy God. And then there was, who's the other one? The Pharisee. Thank you, God, that I am not like this tax collector. 
But that penitent one, that remorseful one, who couldn't even lift up his eyes to God in heaven, it was he who walked away justified. God shows mercy to those who truly need it. Yes. Um, would you say our confession on this chapter explicitly teaches perichoresis? Would you like to describe that for everyone? The eternal, the eternal dance of love between the Trinity. <laughs> Because the eternal dance of love. Yes, it sounds so nice, especially with a slightly British accent. <laughs> the eternal dance of love. Well, look, I have heard that analogy many times. I must say, it is a slightly strange analogy. I have heard uh, Tim Keller use it in the past, that the Trinity is likened to a dance. Who's actually leading the dance and who is being led? The two are moving together and so on. I'm not going to say much about it, to be honest. An analogy is an analogy, and uh, I personally don't really find it very helpful. So, yes. Uh, perichoresis specifically, we can talk about that later on uh, as we continue in theology proper. Yeah? Um, would it be more appropriate to, sell, uh, to say that perichoresis is the inter-indwelling of the three persons of one another because what can be said about any person can be said about God and what can be said about God can be about, uh, said about any of them and therefore they inter-indwell each other. Okay. I think that makes sense. Are you saying that's perichoresis? Okay. I think that makes sense but I will think some more to confirm. <laughs> he is gracious. He is merciful. Now, now, very quickly, here's one way, like when I was a new Christian, this was explained to me in such simple terms, and sometimes that's just so helpful. What's the difference? What is justice and what is mercy? Okay? And that, that getting to that might help us get to this, this amazing thing called grace. Okay? What is justice? Sorry. Well, that's nice. That's a nice little simple way to put it. It's getting what you deserve. You've broken the law. You get what you deserve, which is punishment. That is good and just. Justice must prevail. There are criminals. They must be prosecuted, and um, their sins must be punished. Whatever. That is God dealing out justice. That is God remaining just in all of his affairs. Justice. Getting what you deserve. What is mercy? So when you, sh when you tell someone today, look, I want to show you mercy. Yeah? Well, that's a good way. That's a good, simple way to put it, right? Not getting what you deserve. You have done wrong. That penitent, that, that, that sinner wasn't right in himself. He knew he had done wrong to God, but God showed him mercy. He deserved. He deserved to be alienated from God. He doesn't deserve to be justified, right? But God showed him mercy by not giving him or showing him what he actually deserved, which is to be under the wrath of God and for, for God's displeasure to be upon him. So justice, getting what you deserve, mercy, not getting what you deserve. So what's grace? Getting what, getting what you don't deserve. That's another simple way of putting it. Unmerited favor, we like to define grace as. It is unmerited favor. So when, when God gives us grace when he is gracious towards us. He's not just saying, I know you've done wrong. I will forgive you. And neither is he also just saying, in order for me to remain just, your sins are placed on Jesus Christ so that the, my perfect justice is satisfied. But he's even going beyond that and saying, and I'm giving you what even in this circumstance, you actually, you, you don't deserve any of this. Okay? You don't deserve to be adopted into the family of God. Okay? You don't deserve to be credited as righteous and welcomed into the kingdom of God, to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, sanctified, glorified, and so on. So this is of grace. That's why we have a religion of grace, a religion of getting what we actually don't deserve, a, a religion of unmerited favor. And that's why we can clearly say God is He's just, He's merciful, He is gracious. And that's good. That's good for us. We need it. And he is long-suffering. He's very patient. If he wasn't patient, what do you think would happen to you? If he wasn't so patient and long-suffering, do you really think, as we learned this morning, that he would, to use human terms, put up 
with a faithless bride that keeps whoring herself out and prostituting herself. Now, God is long-suffering, which means slow to get angry or just to be patient. Um, the, the Greek word for patience can be translated as elongated passion, stretched out, elongated passion, long-suffering. Okay, but God is without passion. It's not what, it's not what I mean, okay? Um, not that he suffers, right? Patience by the way, is not just being indifferent. Patience is not just going, eh, keep doing it. Well, no, I'm all right with it. No, it's an elongated, long suffering of being slow to get angry because they are concerned. Somebody is concerned for a person and is willing to postpone or elongate their patience because, you know, the world is coming to an end. People are going to die. Judgment is going to come. But what, what are we told in the New Testament? That we should not mistake God's patience for... What? We should not mistake God's patience for... What? For His wrath? Is that what it says? I'm actually asking it right now because I just forgot. Uh, uh, do not mistake God's kindness for... Yeah, is it? Is it Rome? I'll, I, I should have written it down. Um, uh, well, you know, another passage that I did write down <coughs> to Peter. Yeah, I think I'm mixing verses, and I think I've thought about that one. Yes, I think that's good. Um, here's one I actually wrote down, 2 Peter 3, 9. Um, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, <clears throat> not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Okay, that's an exercise of God's long-suffering and patience that he would put up, if you will, with a faithless people and give them time and opportunity to repent, to return, to come to him and be restored. How patient was God with Israel? I mean, you know, Sam, again, Sam read Jeremiah 3 this morning <clears throat> and the patience, patience that I don't have, patience that I wish I had even just as a husband, right? A true long suffering that we should yes um, so uh, how can God be yeah you, you you briefly touched on it but how can God be long suffering without suffering and how can he have an elongated passion without with being impassable yes yes so that's that's what I mentioned so when we say long suffering we are not speaking there of God undergoing being affected by outside forces it is of course analogical language, to speak of God um, being willing to, well, in one sense, just from a historical perspective, postpone the coming of his wrath and judgment as an opportunity, which is already ordained, for his people to come to repentance, a work that he himself does. And um, the word passion is used in the scriptures of God, uh, not, not the exact word passion, but passionate concepts of God. Um, so like when, when we, oh, what is it in Luke that the Lord has visited you, his, 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 his loving compassion or uh, something similar in that sense? Um, again, it's analogical language, of course. We're not talking about God undergoing, but it's a revelation of uh, the disposition of God towards his chosen people, his beloved people. The willingness to... Um, put up with or the willingness to, to postpone judgment that, that belongs to them due to their sin so that they would come to repentance, be restored, and be united to him. Yeah. Secondly, um, if God desires none to perish, then does that mean that he either fails or has um, un, uh, unachievable goals? Yeah, so good. I mean, this is where some people could disagree with me, and that's fine, but that comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, and the beginning of 1, P uh, sorry, that comes to 2 Peter, from 2 Peter, chapter 3, um, and look, the book begins by saying, uh, Simeon Peter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I think that you can speak in these general terms, but the, the direct purview of that passage in 2 Peter, chapter 3, um, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 
can very reasonably be interpreted as God's disposition towards his elect and his people. Um, that he's not willing for any of his people to perish but to come to repentance. It would be very strange if he was not willing to let every single individual in the world perish, but then he lets them perish. That would be inconsistent. So that's, I take that position anyway. Yes? Would you say that a confession explicitly teaches supralapsarianism? No, it doesn't. <laughs> yes. Press it all the way up. Double tap. <laughs> so when we think about what long suffering is, we, we, at least for us, when I'm long suffering with someone, there is suffering going on internally, some kind of internal turmoil, passions, even physiologically, I'm undergoing something in my body even. I can feel it. I can feel my blood boiling, but I'm trying to withhold it, right, to suppress it. So that's what we talk about when we're talking about in terms of a human. Now, what is the effect of long-suffering? What is the effect in the other person? The effect of long-suffering in the other person is that they don't experience the consequences of their actions immediately. Right? That's an effect in them. So when we speak about long-suffering in God, what we're not saying is that God has this internal experience of suffering. We're literally only naming the, uh, this, a similar, similar uh, a likeness of effect. So just as the effect doesn't take, the consequences of our actions don't take place immediately, likewise with God, God has decreed in his providence that the consequences of our actions do not take place immediately. And so we're naming from a similarity of effect, not from a similarity in cause. Because in God, there is no internal with restraint and with, with suffering. But in us, there is. Yes? Is yeah. What? <laughs> yes, we can move on, Devlin. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, abundant in goodness and truth is what comes next after long-suffering. He is abundant in goodness and truth. This may seem like uh, a weird way of putting it. I will admit it's a weird way of putting it. It's almost as if like he's He's so good, it's, he's oozing in goodness and truth. He's filled with it. He is abundant in goodness and truth. The goodness of God has always been doubted by rebels. It's doubted by Satan. That's what Satan wanted to start questioning when he started talking to Eve in the garden. Did God really say? He's just saying that if you do this, you're going to be like him. Doubting the goodness of God, but he is abundant in goodness. Remember, even his creation reflects his goodness. When he created the world, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then finally, it is very good. The suffering that exists in the world has been used to question the goodness of God. But what is suffering and pain in the world actually a result of? Was it God's power of creating this good world? Or was it the creation's, here we go again, willful volition and decision to rebel against such a good God? Of course, it is the latter. He's not just abundant in goodness. He is abundant in truth. God is truth. Everything he says is true. Everything he says is true. Your word is truth, says the Lord Jesus Christ. So we live in a relativistic world where some might even say your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. There's no actual the truth, ultimate truth, standard of or whatever. But, but we Christians, we, we believe in a God who is truth and is therefore abundant in 
truth. You may have heard some theologians say, well, all truth is God's truth. And there's a sense in which that, that's true. If, if something is truly true, it is God's truth. God cannot lie. God cannot, God cannot say anything that is false whatsoever because he himself is abundant in goodness and truth. Now, continuing thinking of how loving he is, he is forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. You see those terms used several times in the Bible. Iniquity, transgression, and sin. Sin, you could just say, is a general term for missing the mark. Transgression speaks of, it's almost like trespassing. These are the boundaries, and then you decided to go beyond that. Okay, that's trespasses. Iniquity can speak of your, your criminal nature, your criminal acts, or whatever. So these are just different ways, different nuances of speaking of our sinfulness, of, of man's sin. But God is a God who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Why? Well, the previous things. Because he is merciful, because he's gracious, because he is abounding with goodness and truth. Even when you think about forgiveness, forgiveness does not find its warrant or does not originate in us. It's not that we were so forgivable. Why did God forgive you? Well, because you were so forgivable. You were just too cute. How could I not, how could I not forgive such a lovely little creature that has done wrong against me? No, it's not even that. And, and get this, it's not even your repentance. It's not even your saying sorry from which forgiveness originates. Forgiveness originates, again, if I may use the term, in the heart of God. Forgiveness originates from God himself. It's not something that we cause in God. It's something that actually flows from Him. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with Thee, that Thou mayest be feared. Psalm 130. There is forgiveness in God. It, it comes from Him. It originates in him. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. This is our God. Iniquity, try, sorry, what was that? Never mind, never mind. Never mind, okay. Hey, good job. Uh, iniquity, <laughs> iniquity, sometimes that's good. Iniquity, transgression, and sin, you could find that together in verses like Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, iniquity, transgression, and sin. Was there someone else? Caitlin, yes. Um, hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, so would you say then... Forgiveness, like you said, like it doesn't originate with our repentance. So would you say God's forgiveness towards us then leads us to repentance? Yeah, yes. Well, there is an interesting sequence issue there, right? Because we don't actually have that fullness of experience of God's forgiveness unless we repent. So I guess one good way to put it is because, uh, sorry, I guess one good way to put it is that forgiveness originates from God. Forgiveness flows out of his good will and his love and his good pleasure towards us, right? But we will never truly come to grips with and experience experientially and personally that forgiveness um, unless we come to repentance. So our posture is one of receiving forgiveness and what the way by which God has conditioned things so that we receive that forgiveness is that we come to him Penitently, we come to him repentantly, um, and so we get the fullness of that experience of forgiveness. But make no mistake, he doesn't forgive us be, just because we repent now. In fact, even the Christian who needs to repent every day, one of the most comforting things to know is that 
I will continue repenting because I know in Christ I am forgiven. If you say that he experiences, like we only experience his, his forgiveness until we repent, then, then are you led to say that God is, forgives everyone and it's just only those who repent who, who experiences that then? What do you mean by everyone? You well, mean all of his people? Yeah, well, if someone's unrepentant, but they're forgiven, but yet to experience it, is that kind of what you're saying? Oh, okay. So it's, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Caitlin. So, um, okay, there's, there's a difference still between, like, the issue of conversion and then the issue of ongoing confession of our sins, daily repentance, and things like that. Right. Um, clearly, positionally speaking, pre-conversion versus post-conversion, positionally speaking, you are not in a state of being forgiven before coming to Christ. Because forgiveness flows to God's elect thanks to the finished work of Christ, which is applied to them when they are united to him, being born again, receiving the, the, the grace of faith and exercising it and so on. So positionally speaking, we are in a state of darkness, under the wrath of God and so on, right? But when we are converted, we, we are forgiven. That's when, when we actually are forgiven, in, even in that positional sense, from a state of wrath to a state of mercy and grace and union with God and so on. Now, the Bible then tells the Christian disciples of Christ that we need to continue confessing our sins. And 1 John chapter 2 even says that we should confess our sins because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the, right, the righteous. And if we confess our sins, this is for the Christian, he is faithful and just to forgive all our iniquities. So you go, wait, but when I was converted, I was already forgiven. Why is this their need for continuous forgiveness? Well, there's this experiential reality that when we sin against God, we can't, we can't be disunited from God, but it distorts our ongoing experience of loving communion with God. And although we know we are forgiven for sins, past, present, and future, when, when we are engaging actively in sin and are not turning to God for, for help, for forgiveness, and things like that, the, the Bible speaks of, um, it's like the heavy hand of the Lord is upon us. And, and there's almost a feeling of breached or distorted fellowship, and that is meant to lead us into repentance, lead us to confess our sins to God so that we can continue in the fullness of our experience of loving communion with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a great question because there is a distinction, pre-conversion and then ongoing um, after conversion. So it, it, that's so important because are you forgiven, dear Christian, of sins, past, present, and future already? Are you? Right? Even the future sins. Even the current sins, right? But... Do you still sin and need to confess those sins to the Lord? Yes. We are called to. We continue to do so. And there's great blessing in that because even though you are a child of God, the very presence of sin, especially active sin in your life, does it affects you. In your, in your love for God, in your experience in communion with God, in your enjoyment of God and all of those things. And God's desire is always to, to set it right. God's desire is always that, that we would have ongoing, living, thriving communion with Him. And the biggest hindrance to that enjoyment of it and fullness of it, of course, is still indwelling sin. You've got to keep mortifying and, and dealing with these things by the grace of God. So, good news, God forgives. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And now from the love of God, I think we'll make the end of this now, um, we come to the justice of God. So we've already defined at least a simplistic way of defining justice, getting what you deserve. Um, and when God says the wages of sin is death, for God to remain just, he cannot leave any sin unpunished. Do you agree? He can't leave any sin unpunished. And so we continue to read modern English. <clears throat> he rewards those who seek him diligently. And then it says, at the same time, he's perfectly just and terrifying in his judgments. 
He hates all sin and will certainly not clear the guilty. There is a purposeful tension in the narrative of the Bible. When it paints this picture of a God who will not forg- uh, who will not clear the guilty. <laughs> who will not clear the guilty. Who will not leave sinners unpunished who will not sweep any sins whatsoever under the rug. And then you get to our gospel passage from this morning in Jeremiah 31. I will remember their sins. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. That is a seeming contradiction to us. That is, there's tension um, that seems to be there, right? Because God is just. Now, before we get to the negative part of punishment, well, God being just also means that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This is derived from uh, Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Scripture does indeed say, If you seek him, you will find him. If if you seek him, God is not far. He is to be found. God even says, I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am. Here I am to a nation which did not call my name. Isaiah 65, verse 1. Amazing. So those who seek after God will find him. And he rewards those who seek after him. So look, you can have all of your like doctrines of grace, Calvinist stuff, like dot your I's, cross your T's, get it perfectly and everything. Don't allow that to, uh, to, to cause you to reject the language of the Bible, this concept that, hey, hey, seek him and you shall find him. Honestly, like, I, I, did you know, like, somebody comes to you and they're going, look, I'm hearing this gospel stuff. I don't know. Am I really a Christian about this and everything? It is not only not wrong, but it is good and right for you to go, get down on your knees, seek him. Just call out to his name. Pray. Ask him to reveal himself to you. That is not, uh, the, you know, the Armenians don't own that, okay? That's, it's a biblical thing, all right? This concept, hey, did you cry out to him? Have you tried asking him to reveal himself to you? Pray, ask, seek, go and look and seek after God and he shall be found. I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me will find me. Proverbs 8, 17. Notice that word, right? Diligent. Diligent. Not not lax and just, where's God? Is God here today? Diligently. Go. And seek after God, trusting, as a good old reformed person, that when the Lord so blesses this person to, give, to be given eyes to see and ears to hear, indeed, he will ensure that he will be found. And then afterwards, you can sing, you know, I sought you, Lord, but now I see you were the one who was seeking me. That's all correct, okay? That's, that's good. Love it. Love that song. We should sing it again today. <laughs> um, so this, this all, these are, you know, different vantage points of these realities in Scripture. And, and it is true. God diligently blesses and rewards those who seek him. That's the positive. We come to the negative and And at the same time, He is perfectly just and terrifying in his judgments. If he is so just that he is, always rewards those who truly seek him, know that he is also just and he always punishes those who sin against him. Terrible are his judgments. He hates all sin and he will by no means clear the guilty. He is totally loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, good, true, forgiving. Word, no, note that word most. It's always most. And just as that is true, it is also true that he is most just and terrible in his judgment. We all want fairness. We all want equality. 
and we all want what is right and what is just. Many sinners don't realize, though, that perfect justice necessarily means that if they have offended the thrice holy God, true justice must mean that their sins will be punished and that God will not sweep any of them under the rug. And he is terrible in his judgments. That's why we, we, we need the awesome gospel of Jesus Christ. It is right that we would use the law to strike fear into the hearts of those who do not know God so that they would come and see his judgments are terrible. You look at the way Jesus describes the judgment of God going to a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there is eternal torment, where there is fire burning but never goes out, the worm is, you know, all of that stuff. Um, Joel 2, chapter 6, um, before them the people are in anguish, all faces turn pale. What a fearsome God we have. And we should be afraid because he hates all sin. And contrary to popular, popular ways of speaking, the psalmist says, he hates the sin, and he hates the sinner. So it's not 100% correct to say God hates the sin but loves the sinner. The psalmist actually says he hates the sin, and he hates the sinner. That's why there's a problem, all right? Who is going to be burning in hell for all eternity? Your sins? It's the sinner. Terrifying are his judgments. He hates all sins, yes? Yes, you got it. Um, if God hates uh, both the sin and the sinner, and we are to be holy like God is holy, and we are to hate sin, are we also to hate sinners? Oh, are we also to hate sinners? In one sense, yes. In one sense, there is a righteous indignation, if I may use that, a righteous anger and hatred for all who oppose the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. That has a rightful place. But we can't get all schizophrenic then. That still needs to come together with the rest of the biblical teaching and expectation. Love your enemies. So that then becomes the question. Can we love and hate at the same time? And my answer is yes. And we do it in different ways. We hate this sinful world. We hate, you know, somebody once asked, like, should we hate Satan? I'm like, yes, <laughs> you should, you should, right? And you should hate it every time you see Satan infecting and influencing people, yourself, or even those around you. There is a righteous hatred. Satan's a bit unique because we know he's not going to be redeemed 100% sure. The thing about our fellow sinners is even though there's a righteous indignation due to sin and evil that might be in us, we also don't have infallible knowledge. So we are also called to love our enemies, to preach the gospel to those who do not know Christ with great hopefulness that the Lord would use that to actually turn them, to actually convert them. And that is a way of loving your enemies even while there is a righteous indignation. So, I, oh, so I'm pretty sure you touched on this. It might have been... Um, to do with uh, Kyra and Stefan. But I was gonna ask about um, infants or people who are disabled, right? They can't seek God diligently. Would you say mm. comfortably say that because they we're conceived in sin um, and if they're not a part of the elect, that's why they, if they die, like before they could have a chance to hear the gospel, that that's why they would go to hell because they're not part of the elect? Wow, good question. Well. We do have exactly that issue tackled in chapter 10. So we will get there, but just as a little, just as a little appetizer, right? The confession, whatever, there's several ways to take it, and it's very charitable to different views, but the confession clearly states that there's, a, there's such a thing as elect infants who die in infancy, okay? Some of the obvious realities in scripture is we know that <clears throat> God can work in a person's soul, even in the womb. Like when John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb when he knew he was in the presence of our Lord Jesus. We know the Holy Spirit can work in the womb. So we know that even just purely hypothetically, can God save somebody in the womb? 
And we would say yes. But then we get into the question of how? Where does the diligently seeking come in? Where does the hearing the gospel come in? Are we making an interesting exception for these ones? And so on. And we will get there in chapter 10. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. So he is, he will by no means clear the guilty. When our Lord returns, we know that he will be a righteous judge. And we know that he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked, Isaiah 11, verse 4. So as we end this portion of our study, how comforting is it to know that just as God is truly, his judgments are truly terrible, and he will by no means clear the guilty, and he is a righteous judge, and that is a frightening thing, but we also have a full, fuller revelation of God. We also find out he is also most loving, most gracious, abounding in goodness and truth. And going back to the previous impassibility conversation, our status before God, you know, it's an issue of where we're at. God, God is not this changing schizophrenic being. That he's, he's loving and then he's just and then afterwards he's punishing and then afterwards he's forgiving and everything. No, he is what he is 24-7 all the time from eternity to eternity. The question then that we're confronted with is what is the state of our hearts? What is the state of our own soul? Because if our hearts have been turned to repentance and faith and our trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ, God hasn't changed, our hearts have changed. Our sins have not just disappeared into oblivion. They went somewhere. They're still there. They've been placed into the account of Jesus Christ. And we can still say with full confidence, God by no means shall clear the guilty. But wait a minute. He didn't punish us. Ah, yes, but he still punished you in the sense that Christ represented you and took your place and took your guilt so that forgiveness would flow Mercy would flow. Grace, unmerited favor would be procured and showered upon us whom the unchangeable God from the inside out has changed. Any final questions? That's chapter, paragraph one. Just paragraph one. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you so much for this revelation of your goodness, of who you are, and even your terrible judgments. Lord, we are reminded of Moses wanting to see you, and you gave a revelation of yourself, and you spoke about how you will punish sin, but also how you are merciful and long-suffering for those who turn to you. Both of these things are true, not one above the other. And so we pray, Lord, that we would simply glory in the realities that we have come to know you intimately as our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ whom you have sent <clears throat> and through the Spirit who dwells in us. Prepare us as we continue studying the Scriptures, <clears throat> as we go to the next paragraph and consider your relationship with your creatures. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>